Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank Alt for inviting me to be uh, an invited speaker today. Absolutely thrilled, sl thrilled and slightly overwhelmed, but hopefully um, what I will talk about today will resonate with quite a few of you. Um, when Marin contacted me to ask me if I would like to do an invited speaker, of course I said uh, yes, but we were talking about what I could possibly talk about. And she said, well, it might be quite interesting for you to talk about some of the things you do, including some of your blogging. And I'm going to use that word again probably for the, about the 599th time today, the M word. been doing a lot of mooking this year, maybe talk a bit about that. So I thought, well, yeah, I can do that. But I thought maybe I would widen out and actually talk about a bit about what I do and, and life and innovation and what's changing in our culture because our culture in education and education technology is changing and is changing quite rapidly just now. Um, so I don't know about you, but um, when anyone ever asks me this question, people in the real world outside education, my heart always kind of sinks a bit and I get a bit of a funny feeling in my tummy because it's just... Um, to quote Facebook, it's really complicated to explain what I do. Um, and those of you who know me and maybe have asked me this before might have he heard me say this. Um, what I actually do in pragmatic terms is I type and I go to meetings because I think I'm always behind a laptop. I'm answering emails, I'm sending emails, I'm writing blog posts, I'm writing papers, I'm writing reports, I'm reading reports. I tweet every now and again as well. So um, when I'm not doing that at my desk, I'm on my way to a meeting where I'll do quite a lot of the same of, uh, of that kind of activity as well. But it's not just about just simply typing. There's, there's a bit more into it than that. Um, so I'm one of the assistant directors with CETIS, which is the Centre for Educational Technology and Interoperability Standards. Um, until the end of July this year, we were a fully funded JISC innovation um, support service. Uh, a support centre, I should say. Um, we relaunched on the 1st of August. This is our, the plug for our new website, um, cetus.ac.uk. Um, I'm not quite sure why the URL hasn't uh, shown up there. It wasn't in the, the earlier presentation. But anyway, we um, do a lot of work. We cover a, a lot of ground, which is why it's quite complicated to explain what I do. CETIS has been around for over a decade now. Um, we started off as the UK IMS centre and we're well known for working in educational technology st uh, standards um, and supporting the notion of interoperability for systems. Um, we've done a lot of work um, for representing the UK HE and um, FE sector in various standards bodies. Um, we've also done a lot of community building work, so we had a lot of special interest groups. We um, do a lot of writing, we do uh, produce briefing papers, and we've also worked a lot um, with JISC, obviously, because they funded us, and we are still going to be working with JISC in the future. Um, but in terms of helping them uh, think about strategy for technology and innovation um, in education. So we're quite a broad remit, um, and um, we do a lot of events and a lot of different things. So again, that goes back to why it's quite complicated to explain what I do. And when I actually started at, at CETIS, um, one of my, my role was a, a SIG coordinator, special, special interest group coordinator. So it was a lot to do with um, meetings. But as um, time has progressed, more and more of my communication and more and more, more of my work has happened online and is increasingly happening online. So like many people here today, you know, I have lots of places where I'm active online and this is from my Visify um, bio. So you, there's lots of places where you can find me um, online and it's, it's changed quite a lot and it's actually been quite transformational, I think, the way I've been able to interact with people online. Um, and one of the things I think, this is, this is the, the sponge bit. Um, one of the things I think that I do when I'm interacting online and when I'm going to all these meetings, I feel like I'm a bit of a sponge because I go to conferences like this and I soak up a lot of information. Um, and when I was thinking about the title, I was thinking, I wonder, I wonder, could I get away with using squ uh, SpongeBob SquarePants because he's the first sponge that came into my mind when I heard it, uh, thought about that. So I thought, well, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know. I know what I'll do. I'll ask Twitter because that's what you do if you have a crisis. Ask Twitter and you will get an answer. So. Oh, we've um, so I, I asked Twitter, and um, well, Lynn and Dundee, she said, "Well, absolutely, I think you should do that." I'm not sure about uh, Gordon; you might uh, be able to answer this. He thought it might be a bit too ontologically uh, con conservative for Altsy. I'm not sure about that. Maybe, maybe not. Um, 
but also this another conversation with, with David, uh, um, David Kernan, who's somewhere here today, and I said, yes, I'm going to do that. And Rob Engelbright did bring a, up a very good point that maybe if we did talk about um, SpongeBob SquarePants, that might involve David Hasselhoff as well. But hey, you know, if we could get the Hoff tra trending uh, for Alt-C13, then my work here would be done, um, but maybe not. But actually, the sponge I was thinking of was slightly more sophisticated um, and with much nicer uh, picture. I was really thinking about a coral reef and you know coral sponges. And I think particularly in educational technology innovation, we live in a um, quite a beautiful, quite strange world, but it's a very special environment. And there's lots of symbiotic relationships, lots of things happening, things coming and going. Um, but it's quite a delicate atmosphere as well. So that was kind of the, the sponge I was thinking of. Um, when I was talking about this a bit more with one of my colleagues, Lorna Campbell, she said, uh, well, you don't, you don't want to be a sponge, you want to be a slug. And I said, no, I don't want to be a slug. Um, but then she sent me this paper, and this is a, 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 a picture of a sea slug. And I think that's actually quite a cool slug. That's a bit of a stealth slug, so if I had to look like a slug, I, I wouldn't really mind looking like that. But actually, I think probably what I, I think I'm a bit more like is this kind of octopus, a mimic or chameleon octopus. And I don't know about you, but I think anyone who's a learning technologist, you do find you work with lots of different stakeholders and you have to change quite a lot according to who you're talking to. So if you're talking to senior management, you'll have to be able to talk in their, in their language, on their terms. If you're talking to like my people as you are here in Alt, you have a different hat on. And if you're talking to um, people in information, uh, IS departments, you talk in different ways. But you, I have to be able to adapt. And I think we're all a bit, a bit like that. We have to be very adaptable and be able to um, change um, what we're doing. And again, I think going back to the digital, it's been really important because in my role, Although my official um, job title is a research fellow, I'm not really a proper researcher, not really a proper academic, not really a proper learning technologist, but I'm a mix of everything. But I have ha got a, an increasingly visible presence in a lot of different areas through my online activities. So again, I think we're all being quite chameleon-like in, in our activities and what we do if we're involved in technology and when we start using social media more and more. Uh, so. Like everyone, Twitter, well, I, I don't know about everyone, but I certainly find Twitter has been quite transformational in my practice over the last six years since I've been using it. And these are just some of the people who I follow on, on Twitter, and if, quite a few of them are here today. Um, and one of the great things now about having network, uh, online networks is we can, we can actually start understanding and looking into our networks a bit more than we were able to do in, uh, on a face-to-face -face setting. So. Um, Following up some work that uh, Martin Hoxie, my colleague, um, has done, and Martin also built the, the website for the conference. This is his Tags Explorer. So this is just a screenshot from my Twitter network from, from last week. So I can sort of see my connections. I can see that there's quite a you know, a cluster of people that are well connected, but there's outliers. And this has been really, really important, I think, particularly over the last couple of years, to be able to use social network analysis techniques to help us understand community and community engagement, particularly when you're working at a sectoral wide level. Um, in innovation, not just at an individual le level, but at CETA's level, we've been able to sort of look at people that follow us. And it's been really interesting to see the people that we knew followed us and we knew had interaction, but also probably more interesting, the outliers and where the gaps are. And that's been really, really interesting for us. And another thing in terms of an innovation support centre, it's really difficult to qualify what innovation is. How do you know when you have innovated? How do you know when a support centre has done something that's actually had an impact? Well, maybe when people are talking about it and pe people are talking about you or people are following you, but it's very, very difficult to get you know, hard evidence to do that. But if we can start actually showing more our community engagement, I think that gives us a, an additional and quite a powerful supplement to give to funders and other organisations to say, yes, we go to face-to-face -face meetings and yes, we have X amount of people come to them, but actually we can show you the network now and we can show you how these people are interacting. And I think that's, that's really powerful. Another thing in a personal net level that uh, in between typing and going to meetings and meeting people, you can really establish um, really firm connections with people. And I'm sure many of 
uh, people uh, today will be in the same situation that I was at last week. And in fact, practically every conference I go to, I'm now in this situation. I meet people face to face for the first time that I, I, I know, I feel I know really well via t from Twitter. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Assessment Scotland conference and I met Catherine Cronin, who was doing one of the keynotes there. And Catherine and I have been chatting on, on Twitter for ages now, but it was lovely. You know, when we met each other the first time, and how many times do you just, when we just give each other a hug, it was lovely. We really felt we had a connection. And again, I think that's really powerful in terms of innovation and supporting people to have those connections and strengthen them between um, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. There is a bit of a downside to that, but I don't mind too much that people know that I really like Twix and that I do like shoes as well. So I hope everybody likes the shoes that I've got on today because these are my special conference shoes. Okay. Um, well, oh, have the ex excellent. I knew my network wouldn't let me down. <laughs> Um, the other way, I think, um, as well as soaking up, the other way I, I push back out, I hope, is through blogging. And again, blogging has been incredibly uh, powerful for me over the last, I think, probably five years since I've been blogging in a, a professional context because it gives me a space to share lots of different things and share in lots of different ways. So I can do reports from meetings. I can actually write about reports that I might have written about briefing papers, for example. I can do something quite left field. I can do something a bit more, you know, uh, imaginative, a bit more thoughtful. Um, I could maybe have a bit of a rant. Um, I can do something. I think once I've tried to do something funny because that's always a bit of a, an edgy one. But um, that's been really transformational. And again, I think in terms of um, what I am and the sort of chameleon-like state, I think my blog is where I, I feel that I'm a digital scholar. I feel that I really am putting things back into the commu community through my blog. Um, so I've got two blogs. I've got my CETUS blog here, and this is my shameless plug here on the, the other side. I set up another blog uh, last month called How Sheila Sees It, uh, and um, I'd really love to try and get maybe up to 100 views on my blog, so if, you, if anyone wants to go and have a link, that, that would be fabulous, just to give myself a little ego boost as well. But there's really good stuff on both of them, honestly. But the other, the other thing about blogging is, um, I'll explain this in a second, in terms of innovation, it's a really good way to actually sow the seeds of innovation and get feedback back from the community and to get people to think about things. Because one of the things that we're asked to do at CETUS is do quite a bit of horizon scanning and, and you know, thinking about what's coming next. Um, so quite often I'll put out quite um, thought-provoking pieces or things, you know, just little ideas. I'll have seen something and I'll think, well, what if this happened? So just now I'm doing some work with the OER Research Hub at the Open University. And one of the things that they're looking at is, is if they can take the idea of agile programming and um, put that into the context of research so that can they have sort of agile research processes. Now that's quite an interesting concept and I've been reading the documentation about what they've been doing and it, it got me to think thinking about well how would that actually work because in agile programming in software terms you tend to have a specific product that you're working towards that's not always the same in research and very much not the case in um, educational research and research into teaching practice, you're not quite sure what you're going to have in terms of a product. But then I thought, well, if you're maybe thinking of education as a service in the same way as you might think of software as a service, then maybe one thing that might be quite powerful for researchers to think about um, would be the notion of APIs, because in software as a service, one of the key things around that is being able to release and use open APIs. Well, generally should be opening APIs. So they're the hooks into different systems. So maybe researchers themselves should start thinking of themselves a bit more as APIs and you should be the hook into different contexts for people. So my colleague David Sherlock, um, who works at, at Bolton, and again, the links have gone from the, the blog post that I'm referring to in, in this one, um, but it'll be on SlideShare when I put it up. He, t he took this idea and he um, thought, well, actually that's quite interesting. Yeah, I want to be a hook as a researcher so other people can hook into my research. But actually, maybe what I want to know is a bit more about what I actually research. So how can I find out, using APIs, the different places I go into the web and how that's all interconnected? So anyway, we've had this quite interesting discussion, but what he's done, this picture here, these are all the people who have ever commented on my blog. So I know you can't see it, but again, there's a big cluster of people um, in the middle that probably people I, I work most closely with. But there's quite interesting outlying groups. 
So again, in terms of sort of conversations, there's obviously something that's happening around about my blog, and people are having conversations and people are connecting. So again, we're able to start seeing some of the networks and some of the network connections that people have, and it's it's quite interesting. And again, this just does kind of remind me a bit of you know a coral reef or different things happening, and there's all sorts of things happening there. And I think we're just at, at the beginning of actually trying to understand these kind of things and doing more of that kind of topic mapping and, and seeing what else can we understand about how our innovation communities work and how they feed off each other, if you like. So again, to go back to some nice pretty pictures, um, we have all this kind of um, activity and lots of things happening and in our little innovation reef, lots of, uh, of things are feeding off each other um, and that's really nice. And every now and again, we get a big rush of oxygen or something and that's really important to keep us all alive and, and to do things. And I think, um, obviously this year, and I said it earlier as well, um, MOOCs, whatever you think about them, have given a rush of something to our community. Lots of people are talking about it. There's lots of energy um, and lots of things happening. So there's something happening with MOOCs. And even when I look at my own blog posts from the last year, about I think nine out of 10 of my most popular blog posts have all been MOOC related. Um, and it's a great way, if you want to get hits on your blogs, write about MOOCs, surefire hit. Um, but, I think we also have to be aware, and just to use another little cartoon character, I don't know if any of you um, watch the, are familiar with Finding Nemo, but I love Dory. I mean, she's just great, isn't she? But remember that bit where she sees the shiny thing? And I think in innovation, I am quite guilty of this. I see a shiny thing and I go, ooh, shiny. Um, and we all do that. And I think we've done a bit of that with Mickey. It's like, ooh, shiny, shiny. But we have to be aware because sometimes there's something behind the shininess as well. And I don't think we actually know what's behind MOOC, but it, MOOCs, but it might not be just as good as we think. So I think we have to be aware of the shiny as well. Um, because if we're not careful, um, then our delicate ecosystem can die. Um, this is the sad bit. And I think we are facing quite a lot of challenges um, just now, um, particularly in uh, educational technology and innovation. Again, going back to sort of oxygen and things coming in, I think we've been incredibly lucky in the UK to have an organisation like JISC that have put so much money into innovation and technology enhanced learning and allowed us all to take a little bit of risk and do things. Um, and every time I go um, abroad, people are always singing the praises of JISC and isn't it fantastic that you have a national organisation that can fund people to do this kind of work. Now, I know JISC is going into, is in a, a phase of transition just now, but I really hope that they continue to feed um, innovation and technology enhanced learning because we do need that. And as a, a sector, we are sharing, we are thriving. And we need that innovation support funding and I just hope that it continues. So that's that's my plea for all as well. And I think many people in this room have benefited from, the, um, from that funding and I know I've definitely benefited. I have seen so much fantastic work from all of you people out there um, and a lot of it's been funded by JISC so I hope that continues in the future. Um, so my final thing I want to say is just going back to the, the fish that yes we are um, moving in, in maybe slightly more turbulent waters. We're not quite sure what's happening, but I hopefully, I do hope that we can all keep calm and like Dory says, just keep swimming and hopefully we can all keep sharing our innovation and keep sharing our good work through places like Old. Thank you very much.